first sound leads to second sound in superfluid helium. Yes. I, I wrote this all down and left in my office, so <laughs> good on that. Um, and then uh, following that, he transitioned, started working on um, <coughs> questions in neuroscience. So this led to a wonderful year, 2001, in which he published three papers. Parametric generation of second sound superfluid helium, linear stability and nonlinear dynamics in FizRev B. Um, fiber belonger and emitter with negligible reflection for second measurements near the lambda point cryogenics, and multi neural response wind stimuli in the American cockroach. <laughs> in neuro computing. Right? So and there's a, a wonderful period actually that was mixed back and forth. You can see how many uh, words in a. Uh, a um, Oof. Sorry. In, um, the title you need before you know whether it's a cockroach paper or a helium paper. Some of them aren't quite as obvious. Um, and so, um, Dima has since uh, his PhD been at Bell Labs, the Monell Institute for Chemical Senses, um, and uh, Genelia Farm before coming to NYU in 2012. Uh, he was tenured here in 2016. Um, his research uh, focus now is on understanding how we can perceive odors from a variety of uh, uh, chemicals behind our nose. And this canonical example is how can you smell coffee? And I think we all as physicists can appreciate this is the fundamental question because all physics begins and ends with coffee. Um, and uh, DEMA is funded by the Brain Initiative um, and uh, has a lot of wonderful um, things to tell us, including are you Talking about your holographic simulation system? I mentioned it, I will mention it. But this, this wonderful two photon holographic simulation system that can uh, shape light and activate neurons very deep in tissue. Um, and so without further ado, I will. Uh, thank you very much. It's my great, great pleasure to uh, give the talk in such audience. I haven't been giving talks in front of pure physics audience for a while, so. Uh, I hope I'll, uh, no, basically, usually, I, I, I try to prepare it in the way that it will be interesting for physicists, not only to neuroscientists. Please interrupt, ask the question. If I start using some jargon or something I miss, please uh, stop me. Um, but uh, in general, I, 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 I did graduate from physics and switched to neuroscience, and I think it's a great challenge to understand the brain and understand our senses from the perspective of of physics, from physics perspective. I do value a lot neuroscience and biology, we don't need to forget it, but you know, I will um, uh, talk about our attempt to understand the sense of smell that has not been actually well studied by, by, from, from a perspective, uh, computational perspective. And other senses has been, uh, we, we know, uh, we have some successes in the physics or general approach, computational approach, and understanding our senses. And maybe many of you are familiar with the color, uh, human uh, color diagram. And uh, this axis actually is the, uh, the, the, on the perimeter, this is the wave, the, the uh, um, uh, wave length of excitation corresponding to a single monochromatic waves. And you can create individual colors, every color in this, diagram by mixing different colors so everything inside of such triangle can be created by composition of the different uh, colors and color it's it's a perceptual variable color is what you perceive wavelengths is what you you you, you said it's a physical variable and we do understand the relationship between wavelengths and the color very well and uh, it's all based on the fact uh, it's all based on the fact that we have three receptors with different sensitivity that we used to call red, green, and blue. While the red and uh, green are very, very overlapping receptors, this is three receptors of the, uh, in our retina, three different color receptors. And knowing that, we can derive this, uh, this diagram. But it's a very interesting story how it all has been developed and how we Come how in, in the middle, in the end of the 19th century, people come to the idea of three color vision. And physics actually participate a lot in understanding our sense of vision and specific color vision. Later, we know very well the optics of the eye, and overall, we know the, how computation going on the brain from the eye to the cortex, and when we make a decision about the color. 
what's going on in our function. We're dealing with a bunch of chemicals, and there's no one parameter like wavelengths that characterize every chemical. We even don't know how many chemicals uh, are there. And, you know, like we can mix colors, we can mix uh, chemicals, and we can create an arbitrary mixture of different chemicals. And we actually know quite well the structure, well, we know about receptors that are sensitive to these chemicals. The different creatures have different number of receptor types. Humans have 300 receptor types. Uh, and um, we know the genetic uh, background, uh, so each uh, receptor has its own gene, and it has been a lot of effort to discover the genetic organization of these different receptors. And for discovery receptors, in 2004, uh, Richard Axel and Linda Buck got a Nobel Prize. It was a great, great breakthrough in a chemical senses. We know the sound, we know a little bit physics of the, of the sensing apparatus. This is a 3D picture of the mouse nose when odor gets to inside. It's a very, very complex fluid dynamics device. And we know something, we know uh, fluid dynamics, not fluid dynamics, neuron, neural network organization of the system. When, when it comes to the perception, we have a problem. <laughs> so we cannot close this loop. So basically, the goal of my lab and the goal of my research is try to understand how from here, through all these devices, through all these you know, knowing receptors, genetic organization, uh, front end uh, sensing apparatus, and neural network, we make a decision if it smells like rose, like potato, like you know, the grass, or whatever. Uh, so that's, that's the basic setting. So my talk will consist of three, three parts. First, I give an, a kind of general introduction about the sense of smell. That I assume you know nothing, basically, except that we use it. Uh, so, and I'll tell what we're doing in the lab. I will cover a very little part, but I wanted to give an introduction what actually uh, the lab, uh, what we can do and what we're doing. And, um, Actually, being, you know, having physics background, there's two things that I can bring to neuroscience and we can bring to neuroscience is a technology that I will talk very little about it, but I will mention. And uh, I'll talk about our general approach to the sense of smell. The second part of the talk uh, will be about the specific experiments that we're doing in the lab with the mice, trying to understand the odor coding, trying to understand how the different odors evoke identity percept. And the third part of the talk um, is, will be pure theoretical, even though it's, I would say, experiment by itself because this is the first time I'm presenting the theory, is attempt to build theory or function, attempt to do something that we have in vision, and it is very fresh, we don't have yet data, it's a pure speculation, and this is a work that I'm doing together in collaboration with the, uh, my theoretical collaborator, Alex Kulakov. So, without further ado, let's talk about our function first. Uh, we are surrounded by gazillions of molecules, and they are all around us and uh, floating in the air. And in order to sense molecule, we need to inhale it. And uh, it's probably, you can see, the molecule gets into the nose. And um, the first interaction of the molecule with our sensory apparatus happens on the receptor level. They dock into receptors and activate receptors. I'll have it all uh, later in slow motion, but we have a different type of receptors and different molecules locked to different receptors. And receptors, for example, similar receptors color the same color, sends their output axons to one part of the brain called glomeruli. You would need to learn this. I will use this word a lot. They convert this a huge integration happening here. And they send, uh, so different receptors send the information to different glomeruli. Uh, I mean, the receptor of the same time sends information to the same glomeruli, and then they send information to the bunch of next level cells that do some processing. And this is the question, what are actually going on here? Because from these cells, the signals going to the cortex, when some magic happens and the percept arrives and we make a decision, what, uh, what order uh, do we sense? So, okay, let's, we, 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 we think that the sense of smell is similar across, you know, many, many different species, actually, from flies to, to, to humans, and I, I don't, I mean, humans is only one of the subject, and it's actually a very convenient subject because we can ask the questions. The most experimentally approachable subject 
after fly or larva is the mouse. So we study how uh, we make most of the our experiments on the mouse by one of the very important reasons we can train mouse to make a behavioral decision and uh, uh, do the uh, uh, kind of answer uh, if it's kind of to do behavior and we can ask the question not only if the odor has been sensed but has been processed and you know perceived by the animal. Um, uh, so our subject is the mouse and this is uh, cross-section of the mouse head. So the first, uh, uh, the uh, odor gets to the nose, and this is the nasal epithelium, and the receptors are located in this, uh, on the surface of the epithelium, and there's uh, approximately 10 million receptor cells that is uh, uh, located in this very convoluted surface where the sensing happens, and they, they send the signal to the first part of the brain that's called olfactory bulb. This is the first front end fully dedicated to processing of olfactory information. Well, for comparison, olfactory bulb of the rat and mouse uh, can, uh, uh, contribute 5% of the whole brain, while in humans it's only 2%, or 2 tenths of the percent. So mouse is actually dedicated a lot of things to process olfactory information. It's very olfactory uh, uh, creature, and that's one of the reasons it's very easy to deal with them, because they actually attend to the, to the others. Not, humans also have a good olfaction, but much harder to study. It's somewhere in the middle of the brain. Uh, probably mouse is smaller, but I don't remember the numbers. Good point. Um, so, uh, I'm try. yeah, maybe it's, nope. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, this is, physics talks usually have much higher contrast. Uh, so, uh, the, the processing start on the, uh, okay, I hope you won't fall asleep. So the processing starts on the receptor level. So this is our factory receptor cells, and the receptors are located in the cilia of the uh, of the olfactory uh, um, uh, receptor neuron. So this is the cilia, and when the odor docks to the receptor, it evokes some uh, cascade of proteins that I would not be talking about. And everything depends on the receptor itself and uh, how the uh, odor and a ligand match to the receptor. And when it docks, it triggers the cascade, and eventually the signal goes along this, uh, along this wire that we call axon to the brain. One of the uh, very interesting organizations of the system that receptors that have receptor neurons that have the same type of receptor, so, okay. We have uh, 10 million receptor cells, not we, mice. But we, uh, mice have 1,200 receptor types that are defined by receptor gene. So each receptor type has approximately 10,000 10, cells that express the same gene. So receptor cells with the same receptor send their axons and converge together. So here's an integration circuit, integration circuit where all, uh, all of, um, receptors coming together, all recept the same cells with the same receptors coming together and send the information to the next approximately 20 cells, each of these, this blob called glomerulus. So uh, basically the initial information comes to the nose and distributed across approximately 1,000 channels and from there they go to the, to the cortex. Um, now, different orders evoke different activity of different receptors. Some orders evoke, you know, yellow and cyan. I just color them uh, by, by just to, to, to put it in different type of receptors and activate different glomeruli, and different order activate different subset of receptors. So it's not that order, one order, one receptor. It's one order, many receptors, and many receptors are, and each receptor can be activated by many orders. So the code is intrinsically very combinatorial. And luckily for us, we can study this code by using uh, very basic imaging. Uh, we can put a fluorescent indicator inside of the cell that changes fluorescence based on the activity of the cell. And if you put this into the, into the axons of the olfactory receptors, 
and observe it from the top. Basically, you can image fluorescence from the top and present an order, you will see the movie like that. So, uh, if you're presenting the order, the, this is looping movie, but you see the sum of the glomerular got activated, and then get activated in different time. And what's interesting, the different orders evoke different responses. So, you can see this activate more that part, this activate more, uh, more of this glomerular. So, different glomerular activate different responses. We can formalize it a little bit, so the glomerular response looks like this. So, we have different glomerular in time, and we have a very different patterns depending on the order. And this is the pattern that the brain reads to make a uh, kind of sense out of what the order is. And it's very, very combinatorial. If we have 1,200 receptors, the combinatorial capacity of the system is tremendous. Basically, it's just if you have a binary uh, uh, on-off system, you have 2 to the 1,000 power, we can encode all the universe. We don't, we, we, we don't have enough chemicals to... To, to use all the combinatorial capacity. So probably not all of this combinatorial capacity is used. And I will be talking specifically about that. So uh, next thing, we can also go further down the line, computational line, and see who is reading information from the glomerular, from the receptor level. And this is the mitocell cells. We can put electrodes in the mitocell cell layer and record activity of these cells in response to odorant. And uh, this type of experiment we're doing in the lab, basically the typical experiment look like this. We present an order to the mouse and we record the sniff cycle, the mouse inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, and we present order multiple, multiple times. The, each cell transmits information by sending very sharp, temporally uh, narrow time pulse. And when we see the pulse, we put a dot here. So we have multiple trials, and each dot is the pulse that is produced by the cell. So this is cell that's talking about this order at this specific time. That was specific order. And we can average across the trial and see the uh, cell responses. The same response, the same cell responds differently on a different order. And we can collect this data, basically. Can we build a library of different responses? These three orders excite the cell. The cells got excited and then uh, go back to its uh, normal activity. The cell actually has some background activity. But this order actually inhibits the cell, kind of switches the cells off. So this signal is actually the signal that brains hears when the order comes. And you can analyze the signal a lot and kind of build a library of the signals, try to understand the logic of, the, of this computation. So what do we have here so far? We have representation of the order on the level of the receptors. This is on the level of the glomerular, and the representation of the order on the next level, on the level of the cells. And uh, one of the big questions in the lab is trying to understand the, uh, how the signals actually evoke behavior. How all the signals are important to, to drive behavior. Is the encoding of the rows is actually whole pattern of the activity, or what, what do you need to understand that you're smelling the rose? So for that, we actually can go further and try to ask the mouse, what does it smell? And for that, we take a mouse, and we're presenting order to the mouse nose. Uh, being kind of experimental physicist, we try to do experiment as controllably as possible. So you lock the head of the mouse, Mouse cannot move the nose. We present in a very controllable fashion the order, and we record the activity either uh, on the level of the glomeruli or on the level of the next level cells. And uh, uh, we train the mouse to respond. If it one one stimulus, mouse need to lick the order, uh, water port. Another stimulus, they don't lick the water port. So we not only know that the stimulus has been presented to the mouse, but the mouse responded to the stimulus. And it's a big difference. For example, um, for you to smell the odor and to sense the odor is a different thing. We can all be in the, in the room and not paying attention to the odor. However, somebody kind of walk into the room and ask, hmm, there's something, they smell here, and you immediately start smelling it. So I'm actually interested in the conscious perception of the odor when you will report, aha, uh -huh, I sense the rose, I sense the coffee. And that's exactly the question that we can ask the mouse if it's the order that it smells or it's just some kind of random signal in the system. So we can do this experiment with the mice. 
by recording and asking the activity. Now, what's the most challenging part, what's kind of the next step part, is if we know the code, can we reproduce the code? Can we actually study the, the, the question, what actually drives this behavior? What features of this code is important for the behavior? And for that, we can use the uh, modern tools as neurobiology. Maybe somebody heard about it. Maybe somebody heard about this from Mark that called up to genetics. In uh, 2002, a new protein has been discovered. It has a very interesting property. When you shine the light, uh, blue light on this protein, it's called channel rhodopsin. It opens the channels, and if this uh, channel sits in the cell, the cells go activated. In 2005, the group actually put this channel into the neuron. The group of DCRO put this channel in the neuron, and when you blast the light on this channel, uh, hold on a second, oh, sorry. Uh, when you blast the light on this channel, the cells got activated. So now we have a very great, we have a great tool to access the neurons and blast the light on these neurons and reproduce the code that we measure and ask the animal if they perceive the same order or if they perceive the same stimulus. Uh, kind of like matrix business, you know, we kind of try to create the perception inside of the brain. And we can do it on different levels. So first we can put this channel adoption in the glomerula on the receptor level and shine the light using the projector. Basically, we can reproduce the activity of the, well, we cannot really exactly reproduce, but we can simulate the activity of this glomerula using light. And the light pattern looks like this. We can stimulate arbitrary spots in the olfactory bulb. And the size of the glomerulus and the size of spot is quite comparable. So we can kind of create an artificial order by light. But we even have a higher, uh, we can do more sophisticated uh, tools. We can go deep in the brain and uh, put the channel adopts in these neurons. But here we have a problem. These neurons are located at a probably depth of 300, 500 neurons, so the projector wouldn't work. A, the size of the neurons is 10, 20 microns. And you cannot activate individual neurons with the projector that is shining on the surface. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with my, with a, um, then in uh, the bioengineer uh, guy from Technion, Shai Shoham, who spent sabbatical in my lab, and actually now he uh, start his uh, he he became a co-director of a new bioengineering uh, department at NYU. Now he started this, uh, his position at NYU. And we built uh, the system for computer-generated 2P holography. Uh, by the way, the pioneer work in this uh, field has been done by, by a member of your department, David Veer. So we learn a lot from his work. So basically, we can, we're using two photon stimulation that allows light penetration deep into the tissue, and we can uh, holographically create an image of individual neurons and stimulate it in a specific time. So with this, we can basically play this game. With one photon stimulation, we can create the pattern of activity on the glomeruli and, with, uh, and ask what the mouse sends. With two photon stimulation, we can do it with a neuron and play this game, and a long-term goal of this project, we're not yet able to do this, long-term goal of this project, to remove the rose and make mouse smell the rose. This is the idea. So, uh, I mean, this is the overall background of what we can do with the sense of smell, or with, the, with this preparation, what we're doing in the lab. And I hope there were no questions so everybody understands everything. I switching to the second part of my talk. I'm I'm giving is so I can go a lot talking about holography technical issue. I rather would like to kind of switch the gears and go to some interesting computational part and leave it. If you interested in visiting my lab, you all oh very welcome. So having all these tools, we decided to tackle very very basic problem in the olfactory perception. So. Uh, Mark was right. The fundamental problem for physicists is the coffee. So how we smell the coffee? We can recognize coffee uh, at some distance 
or close away or far away. I not always call this coffee, but anyway, we call this coffee by tradition. And these stimuli for us are different not only by visual perception, but also by intensity. So this is a very strong smell of coffee, and this is very far, far away smell of coffee. Nevertheless, you call it coffee. You generalize this, this generalization problem, and independently of the signals evoked on the nose, you call it exactly the same stimulus. And we would like to try to understand how the odor is encoded in the nose independently of its concentration. Kind of invariance problem. Well, we also see it, right? Huh? We also see it. So. Yeah, yeah. You can do it actually with closed eyes. It's harder, but you can do it. No, for sure. But right. The, our perception is already informed by. Absolutely, absolutely. In general, you're absolutely right. It's almost very hard to, to create a single modality perception. And, uh, but but, but you, if, if you close your eyes and I give you coffee versus, I don't know, orange, you will differentiate it. And you will differentiate independently of concentration. That's the point. So you can make the perceptual judgment independently on concentration. And sometimes you can do it, even if you can recognize the coffee independently of the uh, smell of bakery. Oops, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, Mark, uh, it's just because of you. You told me to it's give. It's going to break out later. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, Mark convinced me to give a talk through, through my phone. Uh, so, um, so you can recognize the coffee on the presence of other odors. This is a problem in the presence of bakery or whatever. This is a problem that we have some ideas how to solve, but I will be talking only about the first problem. What's, why, why this is challenging? So let's come back to the, to the uh, um, uh, 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 presentation of the order on the level of the receptors. Uh, I just remind you this picture. We can image the orders. And um, if you image two different orders, you see two different patterns. And brain needs to differentiate. This is one pattern. This is one order. This is another order. This is another two stimulus. They also work to different patterns. But the difference between this pair of stimulus and this pair of stimulus, this actually belongs to the same order. So uh, just to describe this picture again, the strength of the activation, the color, indicate how strong a glomerular is active. And you see different patterns that tell that different glomerular got activated for different orders. So how does the brain put all these four stimulus to one category and these two different categories? We also can ask the orthogonal question, how the brain make a concentration decision. Because I can ask how strong the coffee was, you know, or how strong the odor, and you can actually know this is a weak odor, this is a strong odor, and actually judgment of the intensity is independent of judging, judging of the identity. So what's going on on the receptor level? Uh, receptor got activated, you know, as a function of concentration by a very, very simple model. So, and you can describe it with the uh, Maslow equation and receptor, uh, activity of the receptor is uh, here and this concentration log and this is the short uh, receptor got activated. For the same order, you can make, uh, have multiple receptors and different receptors have different thresholds. We have a whole variety of different receptors. Again, mice has 1,200 receptors. Humans have 300 types of receptors. So when you present an order, you activate a bunch of receptors. And in our factory above, you see this picture. Now, when you increase concentration of the order, you activate more receptors. Uh, now, 4 out of uh, 12, and then 6 out of 12. So how does the brain uh, consider the same stimuli? So this is the basic general problem. And in reality, the intensity of activation of the receptors can be different. Uh, we don't know, we can, a receptor have, may have a different level of top activation, may have different glomerular structure, but it's quite variable signal. Now, if you know the identity of these two glomerular or two receptor types, you know that that was the order of your interest. But if you don't know how at a high concentration, you choose the order. And the solution that we proposed and kind of tried to explore in the lab, that Actually, everything happens in time. The receptor that activated at the lowest concentration activated first, 
So receptor H and F activated first in time, and then HF AG, HF AG LK, and but the most sensitive receptor activated first. So if you pay attention only to the first two receptors, let me do this. Sorry, because I want to see what you see, and I want to show with. The, if you pay attention to the first two receptors, uh, you know what the order is. Very simple model, but cause a lot of problems. Because over the years, people like to study the whole bunch of receptors. And they were kind of looking into whole pattern of activity and thinking, well, if this receptor activity is probably need, need for something. What we're telling that A, it was the time window for, activity, for other identification is very short. And the same part, we're saying that these receptors are unnecessary. So we don't need all receptor repertoire to identify the first order. So I will be presenting you the story about that we call this model primacy coding model that will define the order identity by the P number of the first most sensitive receptors or the first temporal window. We, the model is concentration variant because the rest does the, the, the activation of the first receptor doesn't depend on the concentration. As soon as we reach the first concentration, the rest doesn't depend on it. I will talk a little bit about neuronal mechanism, how this code can be created, how the code can be read. The basic, does it correspond to the basic features, what we know about other perception? And the later I'll do, uh, talk about the experiment, how we can actually define the window of information. Now we need to tell something, that this problem is actually much harder than it seems to be, because in mouse and even in fly, we don't know where the receptor is. When we observe the mouse, at even at lowest concentration, the most sensitive receptor may be somewhere else. Because for a given receptor, we can screen whole signal library of the, of the orders. But for given order, it's very hard to find the most sensitive receptor. So this is an unknown problem. We don't have the data. And our, our approach to this problem, I'll, I'll tell in this part of the, of the story. So. Um, Neural mechanism. So what we think uh, is going on. So when mouse is inhaling an odor, the concentration of the nodes are actually increasing slowly. I apologize, I didn't put a time scale here. It's about inhalation is about from eight, approximately 80 milliseconds. So by neuronal standard, it's a lot. Many things may happen during this time, including activation of different receptors. When the concentration reaches some threshold, this receptor got activated. Low threshold activate lower uh, high affinity receptor and low affinity receptors. So this is affinity axis. So receptors got activated as the time progresses according to their affinity. Now we can say that uh, time of activation of the receptor is a function of affinity. But what also interesting that if you increase the external concentration of the odorant, you create the same waveform but scale it up. So receptor got activated earlier. They basically shift in time earlier, but the sequence is, uh, is uh, keep the same. Actually, this idea has been proposed by Hopfield in '95. Hopfield is quite known uh, physicist. Theorist. He came from actually solid state physics and became very known. And he's uh, he's the father of Hopfield neural networks. But in this time, he was interested in our function. He proposed that timing defined the concentration and the pattern defined the other identity. What his work, they didn't talk about how to deal with this spiking, with this, you know, the spike that got activated, this receptor that got activated at the high concentration. And what we're saying is just let's ignore it. Actually, that can be measured, and we measure this with, in our experiments. If we excite the uh, order uh, at different concentration, it shifts the peak of the activity of the cells early in the sniff cycle, and we can measure the timing of the shift Three-fold shift correspond to approximately 10 millisecond uh, time. Uh, Three-fold three concentration shift correspond to 10 millisecond uh, time shift. Okay, uh, so we preserve the sequence of the activation. Now, how we can read the code? If you remember, the glomeruli connected to the next level cells, and they have maybe, and this is time axis, different cells, and they have maybe slightly different time delay, and they all send their axons to the cortex. So these three cells converge to one cortical cells, and these three, other three cells converge to other cortical cells. 
Now, when order came, these two glomerular got activated, activated the cells, activated the cells in the cortex, and it suppressed, it can suppress the rest of them. So you basically, as soon as you activated the cell that correspond to your smell of coffee, you suppress the rest. So the rest is ignored. There's some evidence and, uh, in the organization of the cortical tissue that actually that's what's happening on, and I'm actually not going to talk about it, but there is no kind of, it's plausible. It's still speculation. It's all plausible. Okay, so how we deal with mixtures? Uh, if you present this order that activates glomerular CATMW, then we're assuming that this is an order that will be called cat. The second order will be dog. What will be if we mix dogs and cats? We actually create a completely different Gilstaut. So this order will be very different because we lose information about the rest of the code. We don't read this information. A mixture is a different object. Now, as I told you, that the timing of glomerular activation is dependent on the concentration. So if we shift concentration of one individual order cell to another, we create a different sub, uh, subject. So two different ligands can create a different gestalts, different objects. And what you perceive, you perceive the first three glomerulae and it creates your object. I actually going to talk about in more details in the second, in the third part of the talk, if I have time. Um, so, at least this correspond to our, our, our general observations. Uh, what is information capacity of this code is tremendous because it's not two to the power of n, but if p is number of relevant glomeruli, it's uh, n, uh, n to the power of p divided by p factorial. So for p equals 6, and this is random number, I didn't have any um, kind of, I don't know why I choose it. Humans can discriminate trillion, two trillions of orders, and mice uh, 10 to the 15th order. This is a huge capacity. We, I, I'm not sure that we're using it. Now, this is a very rough estimation, and you see in the second part when we start talking about really theory of, of this, that we can correct on it. Okay, now the main important problem. What's the temporal window? Do we have an evidence that the beginning matters and the rest is not? So we decide to do the following experiment. We put the mouse uh, in, the, uh, in front of the other port and train the mouse to discriminate order A versus order B. And mouse supposed to lick left or lick right. We do water deprived mouse, they're really thirsty, they want to work. When we present order A, they need to, to lick on the left, order B, lick to the right. Exactly the same way like I showed before. Now, we don't know how mouse make in general decision. Maybe order A is much stronger, order B is weaker. So to eliminate the concentration aspect of this problem, we scramble the concentration for two orders of magnitude. So we presented multiple A's and multiple B's, two orders of magnitude different concentrations. Uh, we are control freaks, so we measure everything what we present with photonization detector. When we trigger the other valve, we record the, the, the signals, other signals with photo, very fast photonization detector. My apology, I didn't put here the time scale. I used to give the talk not to physics audience. Um, so this is about 40 millisecond time delay. So order sets up very, very quickly. Um, and um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, and we record the sniff cycle. We trigger this well when mouse start exhaling. When mouse inhaling, we know that order has already reached its, uh, its constant uh, level. And uh, we, we know what mouse is inhaling in each trial. And that's how it looks like. Again, I didn't have the movie that exactly corresponds to this task. In this case, mouse either leak or not leak, depending on the stimulus. In the current task, they're supposed to leak at each trial, but they lift either left port or right port. And they can do it very, very well. You can train the mouse in a few sessions. They, they really can learn the task. OK, but now we want to play the, ta uh, the, the following game. We wanted to perturb the system at different time of, the, of, the, of this process. And uh, basically, we want to interfere with the processing with light. So we're presenting one order, and we mask the order. But it's very hard to do it with order. So we decided to do temporal uh, light masking. So we, you remember I talked about this light activation receptor. So we put light activation proteins in the, uh, in the nose. And this is the olfactory epithelium and olfactory bulb. 
and we basically blast the light in the nose. So we blind odor, odor, uh, the nose with the light. The analogy is the following. Imagine you're doing this task. Left, right, or right. You're very thirsty, and I'm giving you a task. If it's left hand or right hand, left, right, and you licking left, right, licking left, right, but I show you the picture, and then I blind you with a very strong projector. Now, I, I, you know, I cannot do it with the other, so I do it with light, with optogenetics, and that's, we do it in a very precise time, some time after odor gets to the nose. Now the idea, if I blind you very early, you cannot discriminate odor A versus odor B, but if I move the light late in the sniff cycle, let's say mouse already know, collect all the information, made all the decision, so in this case, I can measure the time necessary for other, uh, for other um, for collection of all other information. So the, ah, what's important thing is that I do it in a very small number of trials because I don't want you to learn the task with the mask because if I start blinding you, you kind of start learning to cheat. I blind you, but some part of the, your visual field will be still getting some information sneak out so I presented these trials, these masking trials, very, very few times. That make this experiment quite difficult. So what's happening? The normal order processing going like this, one, two, three, four, five, six. When you present the light as one and you blast the light and you activate a lot of glomerular, you cannot understand what order is it. Or maybe one, two, blast. Or one, two, three, four, and then blast. So what's going on with mouse behavior? Without a mask, Mice perform at almost 100%, 90 plus percent. This is the level of performance, 50% chance performance that they don't know what the order is. And with the light, so the idea is that if you present very early, they, uh, they uh, don't know what to do, and they present late, and what the time to transition. When we did it at low concentration, the time of the transition was approximately at 100 millisecond, at 120 millisecond, they already saturated to the main level. And as we predicted, if we presented high concentration, the curve should shift, and that's exactly what's happening. Uh, we shift the concentration 10 times, and the curve shifts for approximately 13 milliseconds. What we conclude from here, that this is a time interval when all information has been collected, and you don't need the rest of the information collection. One sniff cycle is about 300 milliseconds. Now, you may ask the question, maybe during this time all receptors got activated. That's not the case, and we've been lucky to find it's in the literature. Basically, in this paper, they measure the activity of the receptors, and they measure when the glomerulus got activated after the onset of the sniff with all the presentation. And they plot the distribution. And you can see that the distribution peaks at 150 milliseconds, and some glomerulus got activated at 300 milliseconds. That was for many different orders, many glomerulus, not specific order that we're using. Nevertheless, if you put here our time scale, we activated approximately 10% of the old, old glomeruli. So if you believe that an, a, in average order excites about 100 glomerulus, glomeruli, then it needs only 10% of that, about 10 glomeruli. So it needs a really small number of glomeruli. So this is a strong evidence that in order to identify the order, we need only the most sensitive and the first activated receptors. Um, so uh, I propose, we propose a primacy coding model that is concentration variant. We uh, talk about mechanism for forming the code, mechanism for reading the code. The code is consistent with some known behavioral phenomena. And the temporal window is actually very, very small. It does not mean that when you smell the wine, you don't appreciate multi, many seconds of smelling the wine. But what it means, that you can say that this is a wine in a very first period of time. It's more or less the analogy is like, you know the application on your cell phone Shazam, that uh, understand the melody by the first few notes? That's how the sense of smell works. Basically, first few notes, first few receptors, tells us what the order is. You use the rest of information to improve it, well, this is wine, later you say this is Cabernet Sauvignon, and maybe a little bit later you can say, well, this is Cabernet Sauvignon 2007. But the first decision happens actually very, very fast, and our factory system needs 
very beginning of the, of the SNF cycle and very few receptors to make the decision. Um, how much time do I have? Um, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, oh okay. So we use this, uh, this notion uh, to actually start trying to build the whole theory of, of, of factory perception. And I actually try to do the whole spiel maybe, if you give me 12, 15 minutes? Sure. 12 minutes. OK. Uh, with my collaborator, who is a theorist, uh, and we start discussing this theory with Alex Kulakov from Coltrane Harbor. And we start building the idea, if based on a few assumptions, how to build something like color diagram for the, you know, I presented the color diagram for the human vision, how to build this, how to understand our factory coding based on a few assumptions. And the first assumption was primacy hypothesis. We need an order is defined by P, the most sensitive receptors. Uh, so um, the second uh, part, the second assumption is uh, evolutionary hypothesis. Is uh, that uh, we have thousands of receptors, mice have thousands of receptors. Uh, why they are conserved? Why how do we need all of them? And so the assumption is that at least for one order, this receptor should be primary. This is the assumption. If the receptor is not primary for any orders, it should, during evolution, disappear. And the third assumption is very controversial. And we have a lot of problems discussing this assumption, and I will have a lot of problem telling you about it. What is the dimensionality of this of factory space? So uh, we, the dimensionality of the uh, color space is, uh, is two-dimensional. We have three receptors. One degree of freedom is used for intensity. And all the colors can be put in two dimensions. Now, what is the dimensionality of our factory space? You intrinsically have the notion of the distance between orders. I can give this experiment. I give you to smell uh, orange and apple. And then I give you to smell lemon. And you immediately tell me that lemon is closer to orange. Yes, you can explain it that it's activate probably similar citrus activate similar receptors, but I'm talking about perceptual distances. In perception, you have the metric. As soon as you're talking about metric, you're talking about dimensionality. And because metric should, you know, you have three objects, four objects, five objects, how you can build the relationship between objects. And if you have this color, that color, and this color, you can make a triangle, you can estimate the dimensionality of the space. What is the dimensionality of our factory space? And when Based on the other uh, color picture, we have three receptors, we have two-dimensional space, maybe we have 300 dimensions, and that was common knowledge in the field. However, we assume that dimensionality of the space is much, much smaller compared to the number of receptors. And this is crucial. There's two reasons for that. The first reason is, um, I briefly mentioned, there was a bunch of work in the field when they try to connect uh, orderance with the perceptual descriptors. And by finding the minimum number of descriptors, they find that only six, the two descriptors defined a lot of uh, kind of, uh, uh, a lot of behavioral decisions based on big uh, study in humans. And six descriptions this define 90% of the variance. But there's another reason, pure pragmatic reason. If the dimensionality is large, we will fail. So our hope of building the theory only if dimensionality is small, and let's stick with these ideas, and maybe we can back off from that later. Are you still with me? So we start again from receptor legal interaction, and one receptor is uh, described by this uh, curve, basically, and is defined by the threshold. And multiple receptors have a different uh, affinity. So the only parameter that defines receptor ligand interaction is affinity of the receptor to ligand. And to simplify the problem, you, uh, we, we know the threshold. If order uh, reached this concentration, this receptor got activated, and this receptor not activated. So this is a binary model. OK, so we will, we will not talk about analog approach. Uh, so uh, let's look at the f situation when we have two ligands. When we have two ligands, a receptor can be placed in the coordinate of affinity to ligand A and affinity to ligand B. 
And this etc. has high affinity to A and very low affinity to B. Now imagine kind of, you know, it's a physics approach. We imagine the creature lives in the universe where only two ligands exist, and, uh, but it has multiple receptors, and they occupy the space of, lig of affinities. So this, and this is universe with only two ligands, two chemicals. So when you present an order, you activate this bunch of receptors, and you divide all receptors on active and not active. So what happens then if you increase concentration of the order, you first activate the most sensitive, then you activate the next receptor, and if P, the primacy model, equal two, you know the order. That's, that's good enough for you. You don't need the rest of the receptors. Now, the same thing happens with order A. If you activate these two receptors, you know the order. What happens if you present the mixture? Uh, let's do some very simple math with this formula. We basically need to substitute it. We have two ligands. If they don't interact, the equation will be like that. We can slightly massage it and take away concentration out of the bracket. And write it in the, in the vector form, where C is external concentration, Q is the vector that is defined by the mixture. CA divided by C, CB divided by C, this is unity vector. It tells the direction of this field. And R is the receptor vector. It's in the in a affinity space. So we basically project all the receptors to this axis. When we increase concentration, we're basically moving along this axis, and we activate the two receptors, and we, create, we know the order, this is mixture, okay? Now, interesting thing, that order A activate receptor one and two, order B activate uh, four and five, and order AB activate these two receptors. Uh, so, first of all, it's a continuation of my previous story that mixture may have a different gestalt. This is your perception, this is different order, different object. But second, this is an interesting thing. Let's create, let's test all possible mixtures. Let's rotate vector Q and we create all possible uh, sets of primacy. So one order activate R1, R2, R2, R3, R3, R4, R4, R5. And we call this a primacy how? This is a subset of receptor. All of them belongs to at least one uh, primacy set. Okay, what happens with this receptor? By evolutionary hypothesis, they should, during evolution, they should disappear. So the creature in this world shouldn't have any of them, and all receptors should lie on the primacy hub. Okay? No questions. Clear. That's the important step. This was d equal to p equal to. By the way, this is two independent parameters. Now, what happens, by the way, the relationship between number of receptors and number of orders is different. It's not what I showed before. It has five receptors, only four orders. Now we go to three dimensions. And the primacy how will look like this, as a surface in three dimensions. And in this case, I choose p equal three. So the order is represented by triangle. It's actually, we can represent order by any, you know, two, three, four, p is independent variable. And we have a specific relationship between, between the, uh, the number of receptors and number of orders sensed by, by the system. Is P equal two orders represented by, by the segment, P equal three by triangle, P equal four by tetrahedron, and so on, by some simplexes. And we can start building up the story, so how order interact, what are the overlaps between orders. But the main question is, you know, uh, animals don't live in the universe where we have only three orders, so what to do? The real number of volatile molecules, maybe about a million, that is limited by, uh, by combinatorics of the... You, you can create molecule more than you know, 200, it wouldn't be volatile, 200 molecular weight. So about a million different molecules with different shape. So the dimensionality of this case space should be a million. We have a problem. But what we believe that we can actually the dimensionality is still very small. And let's look at this, how we can approach this problem. Basically, come back to the initial equation. The condition for the, uh, for the three shows, if we put this to one, and this is three showed equal R and Q. And the, this actually three showed can be measured. The affinities, or one over three showed, can be measured for individual receptors and orders. 
and we don't know this with metrics. In the regional measurement, it corresponds to the position of the receptors in the, uh, on, on the original affinity metrics. But in general, we can ask if this is a matrix of L receptors, M orders, and M orders can be mil you know, thousands, millions, and L receptors is a year repertoire of receptors, can it be low dimensional? Can we decompose this uh, matrix to the, uh, to the uh, matrix R of the receptor space and matrix orders with the low dimensions? This, this experimental question that we don't know yet answer. We try some data, some preliminary data. Usually we get these smaller than number of orders that was already success, but we cannot claim it because there is no yet data that satisfies us. But we believe that by measurement of this uh, nonlinear, non-negative matrix factorization, we can find the minim minimalistic D. And in this case, Q wouldn't be original orders. Q would be some other features in this space. So the sets of coordinate in this low dimensional space will be set of other features of primary orders, like primary colors. We have three primary colors that you can build all colors. Maybe we have three primary orders. The discussion of primary orders is, exists as long as uh, the science of all function exists. So basically, people start studying for a long time. When the colors have been found, people uh, throw everything and starts trying to find the uh, of, uh, of factory primary orders order uh, and the problem is very difficult why we had a success with primary colors by two reasons we have only three colors and we have we can mix the colors very well by mixing filters now and how we colors have been found by mixing colors you ask the subject if it's the same color or not basically by many many attempts if the number of primary colors would be five or six, it would be very difficult. The second problem, if the color would be hard to mix, we also wouldn't discover the primary colors. Now, here we have eight orders, primary orders, and we have very poor machinery to mixing orders. So we don't unless we do exercise that I propose, we propose. And in this space, Order are represented with this kind of triangles or some geometrical features that have different type of overlaps. And we can kind of further study this. For example, we can define different overlaps. These two triangles have no overlaps, single overlap and double overlap. And even not knowing full set of affinities, we can look at the statistics of the overlaps because overlaps on the primacy how would be very, very different than overlaps not on the primary hull. And that we can do it without having all the data. Basically, if you have a matrix this, you can measure it. You choose your favorite number. For example, it's just uh, it's a surrogate data. And you choose the numbers that are for primary equal three. You choose three primary uh, receptors. This, uh, so for each order, this is the strongest one. So for each order, you find the primacy set. And after having the primacy set, you can do this following exercise. You choose two orders, and you see where they overlap. So these two orders, this is three most sensitive receptors of each individual order, they correspond to that. One order activates receptor three, five, and seven, another three, four, and five. So they have overlap. And we can count the number of overlap even in the limited number of data. We actually did this for the fly, and we see that, uh, so, okay, so the idea that this number of overlaps will be much uh, larger than for the random set, and will be a function of dimensionality, P, and the level of overlap. That is computable. I don't want to go to the mathematics and compute it, but you can actually measure the statistics and start estimating dimensionality of the space, and, uh, and they, they kind of try to fit the real data. We try to do it with the only existing set of the data. With larva data, we get dimensionality about five instead of 20 receptors. For fly data, get a dimensionality about seven. We don't have data yet for, for, for um, uh, humans, but that's the program. Uh, okay, I don't have time, more or less. So I can finish here, but I basically also wanted to say that we have a prediction that 
Uh, it actually will take me. Uh, okay, two more minutes. Sorry about that. Uh, so basically, if you have this very limited space, and I give an example of two-dimensional space, we need to measure, you need to perceive the order alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So you take receptor R1, R2, R3, and four, five, and you connect them in a very specific way in the cortex. So in order to perceive order alpha, we need to connect receptor one and two together, and receptor two and three together. And this is very challenging. So you don't connect them randomly to the cortex, but you connect them in a very specific fashion. This number is arbitrary, but the connection is very specific. So from a perspective of receptor, you throw two wires to the cortex, but from the perspective of this wire, of this cell, you connect to two very similar receptors on the manifold that belongs to the same primacy set. And that also can be tested uh, anatomically. It hasn't been tested because we, again, te 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 technically it's very difficult. And we can do it on a three-dimensional cases when we connect one, two, and three together and f uh, three, five, and four also together. This is a testable predictions. And then basically we can start building this manifold and we can start building the representation of our this space in this, in, this, in this way. I probably give you too much kind of, uh, okay, on this I would like to finish and kind of give an analogy. So we did have a success with color vision. We hope we'll be able to do similar stuff in our function. Knowing the property of the receptors, this is receptive field, we can build a map and we can back it up by the, by the wiring diagram and the physics of the nose. So this is the, the idea. So, I, so far I talked about the primacy coding model and I described the, the experiment that we're doing in the lab, defining that the very small number of receptors is responsible and they are very first at the beginning of the sniff cycle that is responsible for the perception. Based on this model, we propose a theory for a factory perception that is based on three assumptions. The uh, primacy, small number of P, the evolution idea that uh, receptors that are not necessary will disappear, that not belong to the primacy set, and low dimensionality. This is a hard assumption. We don't know. We have weak evidence for that. But we, have te we, we know how to test this assumption. That brings us to the primacy how. It has a specific experimental prediction that we can estimate dimensionality in the way I proposed. We can, set, uh, we can find the primary orders. This is actually the matrix of primary orders. We can find the overlap statistics and uh, measure the connectivity to the cortex. So this is a prediction of the theories. And this is, uh, I mean, I didn't go to the math of all of this. I just give you some kind of overview. And um, the important slide of, uh, thank you, slide. This is my lab. Chris Wilson did experiments with the mice. A lot of people help with the different experimentation. Uh, uh, so some of the recording and simulation has been done by other people in the lab. I work a lot with Alex Kulakov, optogenetics, uh, uh, pattern simulation with Shai Shochem, my geneticist collaborator Tom Boza from the Western University. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Are there any questions? Do we learn during our lifetime, apart from genetics, do we learn or, or forget to distinguish some of the world? Very good question. We definitely learn, but I think that we create the main manifold at the very beginning. So, okay. Um, what, where what? I'm driving, I want to ask you if we can test your idea this beautiful idea of primacy how by maybe learning something that will be inside the way to or getting something inside the way to uh, Genetics is difficult to... to yes, test. so basically the problem is that even on the primacy how we have a huge number of combination and you expose during your kind of while you while or you're developing of some portion of this uh, so it's very hard to present the order that is not on the privacy how the privacy how defined by all possible other combinations and we believe that it's kind of defined by your universe i don't know can we learn the order that is outside of the privacy how i don't know but for instance if you are artificially 
Oh yeah, we can. Sorry. Absolutely. Yes. Ma no, we can do it epigenetically and mouse can learn these patterns. Absolutely. But uh, it's, it's a good question. It's a nurture nature. So nature sets up the main, you know, perceptual field, but we can learn to operate on it and learn something that is not built in. Uh, huh? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't want to speculate. Because it's a lot depends on the biological implementation of that. I give the beginning as kind of the, it's all theory, so it's all wrong. Yeah, all theories are wrong. Except some. No, some of useful. <laughs> all are wrong, some of useful. Yes. yes. So exactly. So I mentioned this. I mentioned this a little bit. We actually work with the data. Uh, the, the, the experimental data is the following. So approximately, it's classical data said that many people try to do many stuff. 150 subject has been presented with 150 orders approximately, and they was giving a list of 150 uh, uh, 50 um, uh, descriptors. Now you're working with 150 dimensional space because each order is defined by 150 descriptors. And we exactly take this data set and we see the two, two, two dimensions describe 60% of the variab variability and six, you know, basically covers everything. So that was the first evidence that the dimensionality of the perceptual space is small, but it was on the perceptual space, it wasn't confirmed by biology. What we want to link it to the dimensionality of the receptor space, like in vision, because what happens in vision? In vision, the first dimensionality has been discovered by matching colors. It's a fantastic case. You basically was subject was matching colors, and the three colors is enough to create any colors you perceive. And it's very hard. There's a, some mutation met only in, in, in a woman that you have four colors. You have two reds. It's very hard to find it experimentally. Just because combinations too, much, too many, if you don't know, it's very, hard, it's very easy to miss. Now, um, and only later we found the receptors. Here we know the receptors, we, we don't know psychophysics. So I want to kind of link it together. But yes, right, perceptual space is low dimensional. There was a few works in this direction. Norm Sobel, the laboratory of Norm Sobel and Weizmann Institute, uh, works a lot on different mixtures with humans and uh, present, uh, so dimensionalities, they claim that dimensionality is definitely below 10. That's our hope. That's exactly our hope. Because if dimensionality more than 10, we're doomed. We would never discover it. Well, that, that's why I asked, because if you look at the tasting notes and the typical smell or aromas that people describe, there are sort of more than 10 just for one. But what he's saying is if you go with fruity, and spicy and you know stable or, or whatever like there's like four or five and then mine knows but not knows the right no 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 but they are very correlated there's a problem with lexi with with the vocabulary because there's a lot of correlation in the descriptors wine and fruity has they 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 not orthogonal so we have very small orthogonal dimensions but descriptors can be much more you know i don't that's the that's the whole point uh, yeah. I was Uh, this is so 
the, the, the few slides that I didn't have time to show is actually exactly, can we build this manifold kind of, do you need to expose the animal to all possible smells and then you have the manifold? And that's actually not the case. And uh, I have my supplementary material slides. <laughs> but the idea is that each smell actually goes like a kind of cover the whole man so basically you can uh, the fact uh, the fact that is um, sorry where, where I left my pointer can you, can you share it? no no it's here sorry, sorry. I'll forget so the fact that this is set close to each other so it will be activated close to each other by any others and they are physically located so you don't need to experience this smell to activate this receptor together so that's, I mean, it, it will take me five, but basically the manifold exists independently of if you experience this specific order or not. Uh, so Greg and then we'll go. Sorry, I, I will explain if you can, uh, I need to yeah. show a few slides, yeah. Go, going back to your evolutionary. Right, uh, right. You know, let, let, let's say 7,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, you know, wine didn't exist and probably chocolate or coffee and all that yeah. stuff. And, and you know, human evolution was much longer. Yeah, yeah, much right. Much longer before, so there must have been some, I don't know, primary smells or whatever you want to call them related to human life in a primitive condition. Is that consideration that those would define uh, mostly the system or, or not? Like the, like the vision, it's, it's completely determined by the temperature of the sun, right? The, 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 the photosphere of the sun, so. Well, because we're exposed to the same colors all the time. Actually, the idea that the, 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 the universe of smells are, are the same, and wine actually consists of the chemicals that exist in this universe, and the, you can change the distribution of these chemicals, and it probably is not changing much. So receptors, first of all, the human olfactory genome does evolve, but we don't understand it specifically because it's very, uh, okay. Uh, okay, the answer to your question I don't know. So, but speculation, I can, uh, so this is all speculative, that um, we have a variability between humans in different cultures, grown in a completely different other environment. So the genome has more or less similar, and there's a lot of interest in studying this genome. So, but, but, uh, we don't have yet core number, but there's still, you know, the same genes present in, in a, a very different culture. So uh, maybe the fact that the gene that this manifold is low dimensional keep. So if it will be very low or uh, high dimensional space, it will be much easier to lose one of few dimensions. But in low dimensional space, if this cell is sitting here, it's kind of binded by similar receptors and occupied some portion of this other space and kind of this this receptor is defined by its kind of the surrounding activity that's my speculation i don't know the answer to your question look we we need more data both on genetic level on the on the on the receptor level well let's thank you again